Welcome to Work Life by Design. I'm your host, Mel Marsden. If the last few years have taught us anything, it's that change is inevitable and we no longer need to go to work to work. As a workplace dynamic strategist and the founder of Community, I draw back the curtains on my own business, the clients and projects that we deliver, along with tapping into the knowledge and insights from academics, business leaders and champions of change. I believe that our environments have the power to positively influence our behaviour and performance, inspiring our human potential. This program was made possible with the support from the Alastair Swain Foundation. To find out more, go to alastairswainfoundation.org. Is the workplace really just a task place? This is one of the thought-provoking questions that today's guest poses for us to ponder about our reality of work and the workplace. Dr. Augustin Chavez is the author of The Pilgrim's Guide to the Workplace, and it was after reading a book on the diversity of iguanas in the Galapagos Islands that Gus set off on a pilgrimage from Melbourne to Sydney to explore the impact that isolation has on the diversity of our ideas. Fast forward a few years and Gus is sharing his insights as 34 signposts from his exploration in his book, inviting us to reimagine our workplaces. As an architect and researcher, Gus has dedicated his career to understanding the notion of work and uncovering environments that best support our working lives. His interest in the relationship between people, space and technology saw him pursue a PhD on the evolution of workplace architecture as a consequence of technology development. His work has been presented at various international forums and publication. As a sought-after speaker, Gus has also delivered international keynotes and is a TEDx speaker. He has also contributed to workplace strategies in Australia, New Zealand and Singapore. Gus is presently the Workplace Futures Lead at the Centre for the New Workforce at Swinburne University and an Honorary Fellow at the School of Management and Marketing at the University of Melbourne. Now, in today's episode, we're going to find out how Gus took his idea that he had to explore diversity of thinking to actually walking from Melbourne to Sydney, what the distinction is between a pilgrimage and a walk and how this applies to the workplace how the introduction of absurdity to the workplace can enable us to bring more human traits to our experience of work, why removing friction from our environments can impact our ability to be innovative and its impact on our personal resilience as we overcome adversity, and how the conversation and questions we're asking when approaching the design of workplaces needs to change in order to create an enhanced environment for work. This is a truly fascinating conversation that could have went on for absolute hours with someone who has an incredible mind to explore ideas in a new way, to challenge biases, and to see new opportunity. So I think you're going to absolutely love this conversation with Dr. Gus Chavez. So today I am joined by the lovely Dr. Gus Chavez, who is the author of The Pilgrim's Guide to the Workplace, which we're going to be diving into a lot more today. So welcome, Gus. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Mel. Looking forward to the chat. So Gus, you're an architect, but you are currently working with Swinburne University. Tell me a little bit about your experience of traversing from practice into research land. It's a Incredible experience, uh, an opportunity as well to be able to be in both worlds. Uh, uh, the thing is that you kind of open a kind of worms in the sense that uh, if you stay too long in industry, uh, before that I used to work at um, Hassel at the Science Studio uh, for almost six years. And um, it's great to experience hands-on the projects, and then, but then you start to miss a little bit more the, the research side of it. And then you go to the university and then you start missing a little bit more practical applications of the research. But it's great so to ex- have the opportunity to experience both worlds in cycles. Yeah, well, I really appreciate someone like yourself who has the opportunity to go and do that research because running a business, I'm very fascinated by that because that's actually what helps us inform our ideas and then progress what we're actually doing in practice, but not always getting the opportunity to do that. So someone like yourself who gets that opportunity and then can share it more broadly back with the the industry uh, is very, very welcome. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for consuming their research. (laughs) (laughs) Now, look, you have recently written a book called The Pilgrim's Guide to the Workplace. Now, there's a really interesting story that sits behind this. So I would love to understand a little bit more about what inspired you to do this and what iguanas in the Galapagos Islands have anything to do with workplace design. (laughs) 
So going back a little bit, I'm, I'm an architect, as, as you mentioned, you know, and um, I do research and try to understand the link between the physical environment and how people interact with it. And one of it is the configurations that they form, uh, how much they interact with each other based on different uh, space configurations. And so we did a lot of research using social network analysis that allows you to see uh, different parts of um, uh, the organization, how they configure themselves and so on. And so I was traveling with some frequency uh, back to Sydney to present the results of the research. I live in Melbourne. And one of those uh, flights back home, I was reading a book uh, on a flight that it was about trying to explain uh, Darwin's theory of evolution based on the iguanas in the Galapagos Island. Because if you know uh, the Galapagos Island or the story of the uh, theory of evolution, it argues that um, the, there are three different different uh, kinds of iguanas, different species of iguanas in three different islands. And uh, the reason why they evolve so differently is because of isolation. Iguanas in, in one island did not mix with iguanas in another island and so on. And through millions of years, they evolve quite differently. So this allow uh, the iguanas to really be very different from each other. And as I was reading this on the plane, I started reflecting on what I just presented early that morning in Sydney, that it was about fostering uh, interactions with employees to deliver innovation. You know, the, what we think that collaboration and interaction is what deliver innovation. But now I was reading that it was in fact isolation that created diversity. So I thought, well, can isolation create diversities of ideas, not of species, but of ideas? So it was a very long flight, even though it was just one hour. Uh, in my mind, it, it all these crazy ideas. Uh, and that's what I thought still on the plane. What will happen the next time I have an idea? Instead of sending it by email, picking the phone or catching a plane, I will have to sit with it for the time that it takes me to walk from Melbourne to Sydney. And I will use that uh, time as an isolating factor to infuse diversity in such idea. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so many bits in that. So firstly, the iguanas are diversifying in isolation. And I can see how the concept of that gets applied back to the workplace. And I can also see how, you know, most of us and myself included, we think that by creating these workplaces where we can bring people together to collaborate, to connect and to, you know, share ideas, that's how we're going to get innovation. But what you're suggesting here is that by having this isolating factor of time and not sharing those ideas, that we can potentially get greater diversification of ideas from that process instead. That is correct. And uh, just by chance, while I was testing this hypothesis in a very unconventional way, uh, researchers for uh, Harvard, Harvard Business School, they were doing a very similar research, but with more traditional methods of experiments. And what they did is, uh, I describe it on the book, but basically they have three groups. One group that was uh, interacting frequently, other one every now and then, and other one isolated. And what they found is that the group that was isolated came up with their more unique ideas. But of course, there is a sweet spot between having unique ideas and applying them to innovation because the, the uniqueness of idea in and on itself does not translate an innovation. The idea needs to be coordinated. And coordination happens best with others and collocated. So there's another, I um, structure uh, the findings of the, or the insights of my pilgrimage in signposts, which I call them lessons. So one signpost is isolation. Let's, uh, isolation is good for innovation, but signpost five, I believe, it tells that there's a balance between how much time you need to be isolated for the quality of the idea, because at some point that iguana needs to compete with environment and so on. So we need to share that idea for coordination, but also physiologically and mentally, we need to be with others. So it's not, I'm not advocating to be recluse or hermits in the workplace, 
just to have a right balance of being together and being apart. And I think that's an interesting point because that probably goes a little bit to the fact that we're now working in more hybrid work environments where we are able to isolate for short periods of time and then come back together in group thinking. So it's having that ability to, I suppose, even can be more consciously deliberate about the way that we structure the type of work that we do and utilize our various environments to support that consciously um, in the way that we actually go about our work. Absolutely. And so one of the conclusions of uh, research from um, Harvard Business School was actually in 2018, before the pandemic. And one of the conclusions was that organizations should be redesigned to intermittently isolate people from each other's work to uh, help solve complex problems. And what we have now, hybrid, uh, is the perfect scenario for that because it allows the combination of both worlds. So if managed well, hybrid can present a very good opportunity to innovate in that way. Mm, And it really changes the nature of the work that we're doing when we're in the workplace then as well, which we get to in a few other signposts. So now to test your theory, you physically walked from Melbourne to Sydney. Tell us a little bit about that experience and what you found the most challenging through that whole ordeal and why you decided that that was the best way for you to test your theory. (laughs) (laughs) I decided, uh, I mean... Sometimes when I explain this, uh, people kind of assume that I had that idea in the plane and then I just got home, have a shower and pack my backpack and start walking. (laughs) It it, it didn't work like that because, I mean, it's such a crazy idea that who in their right frame of mind does that? So, I mean, when I landed, I actually could not sleep that night thinking about what type of society we will live in if we have all these diverse ideas. I imagine them as diverse as as the species that we have of animals, you know, roaming around us. But it's crazy. So it actually took me two years to do it. And it took me two months to be able to verbalize the idea to tell someone else that I was going to do this because who in the right frame of mind do this? But then I still, back in the day, I don't know if you remember, but we were immersed in these conversations about activity-based working, open plan. There was no diversity of thought, even in the jobs that we did. So one conference too many in uh, in ABW, I thought, no, <laughs> I need to infuse diversity in this. And that's when I thought, I'm going to do it. it. took me two years uh, to make the decision, start training, and then, yes, put on my backpack and start walking. And uh, I started walking from uh, Federation Square, and my goal was to go to the Sydney Opera House. And those of you that know Melbourne will know that Federation Square is very close to uh, the National Gallery, which is a kilometer or so, uh, or less than that. By the time I reached that, I started thinking, what the hell am I doing? You know? (laughs) You're only a K in. Like in. I mean, I was already there working with my backpack and this and that. Did I really just put my life on hold? I had to take leave without pay at work and all this because I read a book about iguanas in the Galapagos Island and I want to do this to incubate a unique idea about workplace design. Am I really doing this? <laughs> Uh, so, and I start putting a lot of pressure in myself to come up with a good idea. And I still remember those ideas that I have from the National Gallery in the new next kilometers. But they were so silly. Like I tried to put pressure, well, this better be worth it. And it was not until I settled and didn't put any more pressure on myself that I allowed myself to get into the pilgrimage, not the walk, but the pilgrimage mindset. How many days in do you think that was before you actually got to that mindset shift? So the mindset sh- shift uh, happened um, within three days because I had two rules. Um, pilgrimage have rules and I created my own. So rule one was no distractions. So no music, no podcast, no nothing. And the other one was to do it alone. Uh, so to have time to think about my ideas and also in isolation with um, other people that I knew or no support team or anything like that. And so for the first three days, I, there was that level of excitement, right? So I'm doing this. And even though it was still 
not sure about it. Uh, there was some level of excitement, but by the third day, walking for hours, it starts to get a bit boring. And that's when I thought, well, I'm bored beyond belief. And I was very, very tempted to start, um, you know, listen to music or podcasts or something like that. But because boredom, and that's another thing that I uh, mentioned in the book, uh, we're not used to it, especially in this day and age. We have lost our capacity to be bored. But uh, I believe that if you can transcend that, it's, if properly managed, you can get in a, see the world differently. And I'm thankful that I did it because I now see boredom as being beautiful, as a, as a thinking tool that allows to reach thoughts that cannot happen in environments that are continuously stimulating us. So I would say it took me around three days to get in that mindset. But the pilgrimage for events that I mentioned in the book, and perhaps we're going to touch on them, really started on day 33. Uh, it takes a lot of time to get to that zone. And it's about a 42-day journey? It, it was a 42 um <laughs> Altogether, it took me for two days uh, to get there. So, yeah, it's fascinating how your thinking evolves. And the difference between a walk and a pilgrimage, uh, you know, the, the walk is linear uh, from A to B, but the pilgrimage is completely another structure. Uh, your thoughts kind of diverge, converge, uh, follow a different path. Mm. And you had a really great illustration of that in the book as well. You know, you, you've got the map, which is obviously very linear, and it's like this is the road and here we go, but then you can, there's like these little offshoots and these sprouts of ideas and thinking. And, you know, one of the things that kind of struck me was that about that was, you know, it's kind of like a river and it's like all the little creeks that kind of offshoot and find their, their way around on the, on the edges. So it was really interesting. I think that's really kind of dives into one of the first lessons that I wanted to kind of um, dive into a little bit more. And it was signpost number 28. And it's around lessons that are derived from instances where work cannot be done. Now, I'd love to explore that a little bit more because that sounds really interesting as a signpost in itself. And you give a really great example of prisoners in a jail who are up early trading things off so that they could get to this one job of feeding the fish in the fish tank. So can you kind of just explain to me a little bit more about what that looks like and how do we get to this idea of creating a workplace where work, it's not actually work that's getting done? I'm glad that you pick up that on that um, signpost because a lot of our understanding of work and how we apply that into workplace design is our ability to work. But there's so many lessons that we can learn from instances in which we cannot work. And that is the difference between tasks and work. Uh, one of the things that I believe is holding the office back is because for too long it has been the task place, uh, not the workplace. Uh, the office has become a task place, an environment that we go to do tasks, and that favors the view of work, of instances in which we can work. But if we think about, well, what will happen to us if we cannot work? And as you mentioned, when we're in jail, we lose our liberty, but also our capability to work. We don't need to wait for AI to take over our jobs to see what will happen in those scenarios. We have already environments in which that happens. Also, instances in... Um, non-human primates like in zoos, animals kept in captivity, will see how uh, they need to be challenged in the things that they do so that they thrive. Uh, so if we think about work, what gives us sense of identity, purpose, meaning, and all those things, then we see that it can manifest, as you mentioned, and perhaps the reader or your listeners can read that part of the book, that um, can be as something tribal as feeding fish, but so purposeful. So we can design better workplaces if we understand the instances in which work cannot happen and the difference between tasks and work will surface, which I think is very important. I think that's a really interesting distinction that you've made there too because I would I would support that thinking that the workplace is very much a task place and when we start working with clients and we're, you know, engaging in workshops, a lot of the conversation is around, well, I need to come to work and I need to sit at my desk and I need to sit in front of two screens because I need to do my job. And 
the the conversations that are happening around that piece of real estate that people kind of occupy and think is the only place that they can do their their work is really interesting because I, I start to challenge these ideas of going, well, is that the only thing that you're doing when you're coming into the workplace? What about the meetings that you're having, the conversations that you're having in the kitchen, you know, in the corridor, those other sorts of instances and the other styles of work that is happening? And how can we better support that by looking at our workplace more creatively, I think? Yes. Uh, and one of the things I mentioned in the book, I, I invite people to do this exercise to think, um, which I actually practically did while I was in my walk. I thought about my backpack and then I thought about the items, which items were there to progress the walk and which items were there to progress the pilgrimage. We already made the difference between the walk is the physical beat and the pilgrimage is uh, the reason why you do it. And it's more process of the mind. So there's a beautiful metaphor or analogy between work and pilgrimage and tasks and walking. So you can think about that in that way. So when I was deconstructing and taking things out of my backpack, I thought, well, boots are for walking. Uh, my tent are for walking. All the things that support the walk. What items am I carrying that supports the, supports the pilgrimage? And there were only two a notebook and a pen that for me to capture that. So the exercise that I invite the reader is to think about the workplace as a backpack and start looking at it, what items allows them to progress tasks and what items allows them to progress uh, work. And what I found when I did that exercise for myself is that it's very hard. It's okay. You can do it individually uh, because the concept of work is very personal, but you cannot generalize it. Going back to the feeding the fish, if for some people might be feeding the fish, which is important. Um, for me, it was uh, things in the workplace that created purpose, but they were very uh, subjective. So I will invite your listeners or readers to think about the workplace, what progress tasks and what progress work. And that kind of takes me into the next guidepost that I want to talk about, and this is around absurdity. And this one I find kind of interesting because you're stating here that absurdity actually helps create meaning and purpose in work, which is what we've just been talking about, what is making work more purposeful. And I think that ties nicely into one of the other next signposts, which is around the fact that the workplace needs to be supporting human traits at work, you know, those things that make us human and individual. Can you give us some examples of how absurdity shows up in the workplace and how that then contributes to meaning and how that's connecting to us as humans? Yes, and absurdity is one of the most important uh, signposts in the book, but it's one of the trickiest one. And sometimes I don't discuss it because I cannot go where it needs to go and then people kind of, uh, they don't get it. But Let's um, go there. Because let's go there. And we've let's got see. the opportunity here. Let's do uh, it. <laughs> and let's see how far into it we can go. But the reason why I, I think first it clashes so much is because when you think about the workplace, the workplace, uh, the, sorry, the office, not the workplace, the office has evolved to be a temple of rationality, uh, a place where we go and we apply reason to achieve our objectives. And for many, many times, uh, many, many years, uh, emotions, they didn't even have a place there. 70 years ago, if you show emotions, you were perceived as not rational. If you were not rational, you were not perceived to be able to do your job well. So now we're starting to embrace emotions in the workplace and even uh, emotional intelligence as part of, uh, of the work that we do. But it stands in opposition of scientific management of these ideas that we are clogs of part of a machine and, and there has to be that certainty. And then the moment you throw uh, absurdity in, it kind of clashes with it. But the reason why I believe absurdity is so important is because at this point in time, that technology is asking us questions of, of what it means to be human with AI. I mean, technology has already replaced our bodies in the factory line, in the production line, but it started to replace our mind. And it's starting to ask bigger questions of what it means to be human. Creativity, now we know, it's not one of those reasons. Generative AI can write novels, can do paintings, can do recipes, cook recipes. So I believe one of the 
core characteristics of being human is our ability to be absurd. Of holding two propositions that cannot be simultaneously true, but if they are, they can deliver unimaginable better features, like a bird made out of metal that flies. That's ridiculous, but then you have the airplane, and that transforms society. So the other type of innovation, the logic-based one, is about doing what we're currently doing faster, cheaper, but the transformational innovation, I think, is achieved uh, through absurdity. And the other signposts that you mentioned, then if the purpose of the workplace is to promote uh, the human qualities, one of those qualities, I believe, is absurdity. Enjoying the episode? I would love it if you would share this show with just one person who you think it would inspire. Just one. The more we can share the insights of what it takes to make work work, the closer we are to elevating everyone's experience of work. So how can I create more absurdity in a workplace? Like, What could I physically do to, to shake things up a little bit more? There's a whole chapter of that in the book. There are a few things. First of all, this has been explored a bit more in management literature. James March, uh, he created back in the 70s an amazing uh, technology. He called the technology of foolishness. How can we use foolishness as a technology to deliver uh, innovation? Uh, he talks about play as an opportunity to create rules that are different from the uh, rules that we experience in the real or the normal world. A lot of um, the paths that I explore around absurdity has to do with exploring the absurd temporarily and then go taking that vision back to the reality and coordinate it. Uh, one framework that is particularly interesting is the carnival. So carnivals in the medi- medieval uh, era, the king dressed up like a peasant, the peasant dressed up like a king, and it's an opportunity to see the world the upside, the, the reverse world, to throw away uh, all the rules of how society works and create new relationships. But again, we see a very important aspect there that is temporarily. Carnivals don't last forever, but allow us to see reality in a different way. And I have seen this instances of carnivals in organizations, not by people wearing masks, but creating a a different version of the organization. And I saw that, for example, some of the organizations in Australia, perhaps around the world as well, on Friday, they have Friday drinks, you know, at around 5.30 or so. By the end of the the working week, um, they put some drinks and nibbles. And then you can see the EA, the executive assistants, uh, serving uh, uh, drinks to the uh, CEO or CEO to the EA. And, and w- they're mingling in a way um, that is, resembles a carnival, not because they put masks, but because they flatten the hierarchy. Yeah, dissolution of hierarchy changes. The hierarchy, and, and, and so there are opportunities and instances there that allow us to think differently. Another way that uh, it's documented in research is disorderly environments. So disorderly environments, messy environments, allow us to um, seek alternative routes. There are interesting experiments that I mentioned in the book. Uh, switch that also mentions perhaps a reference that if we try to have tidy, uh, beautiful environments, prevent us from exploring alternative uh, routes. And the again, this comes from uh, management, the management of paradoxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that field of work argues that those organizations that are better manage, managers' um, paradoxes are better prepared uh, for the future. And lastly, there's a fascinating book uh, from Michel Foucault that I mentioned in the book as well. It's called Civilization, Madness and Civilization. And it revisits or it makes a commentary about our relationship with madness, how we used to have a common dialect, because we believe that the mad person lived in the boundary between the real and the uh, the crazy. And we have that common language and that language has been lost. Uh, So I put forward the idea that perhaps the management of paradox is a way 
of rekindle that language that we used to have with the madman that has been lost. Fascinating. So one way that I see that could come to fruition is in an organisation in terms that I see happening more readily is team building activities, things where people are getting out of their comfort zone, they're doing different sort of challenges and things within the workplace that are not actually work but create relationships and form different, I suppose, different parts of behaviour between teams because they're engaging in different ways. Would that be a correct kind of analogy and assumption? It will be correct, but there's uh, some footnotes that I will add. And uh, again, in the book, I explored this a bit more in detail, but there's research out there that is really strong in arguing that the same number of people working isolated produce better ideas than the same number of people working in group. So we should not use brainstorming activities or group activities to create better quality ideas. We should do them to create the social glue that will hold the organization together. So to your point, do it for those reasons so that you can create social glue and do that. But also let's not forget that it's been increasingly recognized, especially after the book Quiet by Susan Cain, that there are different types of people and that they relate to the environment and to others in different ways. So you have the extrovert and you have the introvert and you have a continuum in in there. So for too long, the workplace or the office and organizations themselves have been designed to reward one type of behavior, which is the extrovert. You know, we take this, we make decisions together in meeting rooms and we favor those that can articulate them better than the quiet person in the corner that perhaps cannot put their ideas in the same way. This type of team building activities might alienate some of those that feel uncomfortable uh, participating in those. So if we can come up with ways of uh, being inclusive in this type of creating organizational glue that caters for all, perhaps will be better. Yeah. And one of the other things that you mentioned in in the book was around the reintroduction of rituals and other sort of routines within the workplace and how they can then support the organization. Can you just explain that a little bit more for us? Because I think that's something that I'm seeing happening more and more within workplaces now is this reintroduction of rituals and routine. Yes. So after I did the um, physical pilgrimage from uh, from Melbourne to, to Sydney, then came the pandemic. And during the pandemic, uh, you know, our world of work changed and also the way we interact with digital environments. And it was one of those days, I think it was checking Instagram or whatever, that I came up across doing a virtual pilgrimage. So you can now do El Camino de Santiago, which is a very uh, famous pilgrimage in Spain, virtually. So I thought, well, this is interesting. What if I do it? And... There are many lessons that came out of doing that virtual pilgrimage. So basically what it involves is you walk wherever you want. In my case, it was the lockdown. So I used five Ks around my house because of the restrictions. And then I uploaded my uh, kilometers to this website. And then you see how you, much you advanced. And then that's when the contrast between, again, tasks and work and walk and pilgrimage became even more important because the task was walking, but the pilgrimage was supposed to be happening somewhere else. And gamification is being increasingly used as a way of instating or injecting purpose in an otherwise over-effective environment. So as we look at tasks, we look at opportunities of how can we do faster? How can uh, we, can this process take less time or, or, or be more efficient? And usually what we remove are things that add purpose to the activity, which increase the time that it will take. And by doing that, we create very uh, efficient tasks, but at the expense of purpose. To inject that, then we have to create a, 
gamification. And I mentioned an organization during the book that makes work a gamified process that you can be the hero of your workplace and you can uh, in, be in journeys in your workplace. Why? Because perhaps their job is just getting into Excel spreadsheets and completely task driven. They don't get any purpose from their daily activities and purpose needs to be reinjected through gamification. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to find a new way to kind of motivate and inspire people because that purpose has been taken away from the fact that we've become so task orientated and so process driven and so performance outcome based. Exactly. Max Weber, which I mentioned in the book, a philosopher and an economist, he argues, he makes the point from our time in agriculture. So people looking at agriculture, they say, well, they used to have these festivals, you know, they have a successful crop, then they have a festival and everybody was enjoying it and gave purpose and meaning. And someone said, well, guys, if we, uh, what if we stop doing that festival and keep doing uh, the, the working, uh, we will um, be more effective. And yes, they produce more crops, but at the expense of having less meaning. And now uh, agriculture is just putting seeds in, uh, in the soil for them to, to grow. It becomes a bit pointless, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. Now, one of the other signposts that I want to dive into is around adversity. And the reason I really want to talk about this one is because I think as a society, we have done everything we can to eliminate adversity from our world. Having said that, we've just been through, you know, three years of very adverse situations, but even you mention it in the book, you know, what we're doing in terms of the way that we protect our children and the terms of safety that we're trying to put into playgrounds and all those things is we, we try and eliminate the risk of anyone getting hurt. But I think, you know, my personal view of that too is that that's also then eliminated a lot of our ability to be resilient. And I think from resilience, we, um, we become a little bit more accustomed or a little bit more comfortable with the general discomfort of work and the general discomfort of life that does come. And in that, you know, there's that's where we have the growth mindset. You know, we don't grow from being in this bubble. Um, we need that sort of challenge to be able to grow, to expand that circle of, uh, of comfort and, and circle of control, which then also enables us to push boundaries, which then means we're going to take more risks, which we can create more innovative ideas. Can you give me an understanding of how you see adversity showing up in the workplace? How can we introduce more adversity because I know even in the work that I do a lot of it is around how can we make it easier for people to do all the things that they need to do where does that adversity actually show up in the workplace that then can actually add value to the outcome or the thinking or the experience of work itself I think you already summarized it very very well um, just to contextualize it in into my experience the most important in signposts or lessons that I got out of the pilgrimage uh, were out of ad adversity. So I did my pilgrimage in winter because I wanted to avoid snakes and fires, and it worked because I didn't just I just saw one snake and didn't have any fires uh, to go through. But I was freezing cold, and I I was cold, I was hungry, I was tired, but out of those circumstances came very valuable lessons. But at the same time, I was carrying an inflatable pillow <laughs> to maintain some comfort. So what I'm trying to say here is the literature is rich in highlighting instances in society as large that adversity has promoted innovation. Even Wars is, uh, you know, the the biggest leaps in technology sometimes occurs uh, during wartime and so on. Indivi as individuals, we experience periods of growth when we experience adversity. But when we talk about workplace design, we try to use design to extract it. And design seems to be hardwired that that is its purpose. Some signposts mm. are more difficult to follow than others. And this one in particular, like absurdity, is very difficult. So much so that in the book, and I'm trying to find it here in the, in the, uh, in the printed version, I did a map, a knowledge map, and I'm going to put it here. It's there. People can yep. see it on uh, page uh, 128 of the book. Uh, because even though knowledge is invisible or intangible, um, you can do maps. You can map uh, knowledge and see the regions and see how adversity travels 
in an organization. Now, there are two environments. One is the intangible, that is the organizational culture, and the other one is the tangible environment. And so we will see that in intangible environments, that is uh, research through management, and they're more curious about this proposition. There, I came across fascinating articles, one of them positioning collaboration next to adversity as a way to increase creativity in scientific endeavors. Uh, we don't have those type of questions in design. In design is how we can reduce adversity to make it better environments. And we have this aspiration for frictionless design, as we see it as a pinnacle of what we should strive for. But there's this argument that we can use, we can challenge our adaptation with environment. There's a field of theory called uh, mind-environment interactions that argues that we are in constant adaptation with our environment. Once we reach an adaptation, the environment becomes kind of invisible. But if we change the demands that the environment requires from us, we pay more attention to the environment because we try to adapt. So it's by changing our environments and the demands that it asks from us that perhaps we can use increased adversities in the environment to make us think differently. And like you said, some of these things I think are actually quite challenging to implement in a workplace. But I think even just having the conscious thinking of that to go, how are we introducing adversity or how are we t- or eliminating adversity and how can we, you know, introduce more absurdity? And a lot of this also doesn't necessarily boil down to the environment itself. It's sometimes around the work practice and the work policy or the way that the culture of the organisation is. So it's looking at it more holistically and how can we start to touch on a few of these things? Just Sorry, just to qualify, because you make a very point, I'm not advocating for the absurd, isolated, and adverse workplace. <laughs> I think what we I'm, should do that. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is, and this is a lesson from the sit to stand um, phase that we went. You remember back in the day when we wanted to see how long, how much time we needed to be sitting down or standing up, and now they're the recommendation is that the best position is the next one. So if you're sitting down for too long, stand up. Exactly the, the same with the signposts. If you are operating for too long in the rational mode, explore the absurdity. But after absurdity, go back to the rationality. If you're too comfortable, allow yourself to be uncomfortable uh, so that you can think differently. The same with boredom, the same with isolation. Uh, because... Some people, you're not saying that, but others um, might believe that perhaps what I'm advocating is from just one mode. No, I'm advocating for both modes. Yeah. So we're not building a circus and we're not building (laughs) something that's completely impractical. We're trying to create an environment that supports a lot of different types. But And I think that goes back to the idea again, too. It's not necessarily going to be the physical environment that is going to be creating these challenges. It's a thought process. It's a culture. It's an activity that is going to disrupt that continuum of thinking and create change. The analogy that I like to put forward is if you think about a chessboard, the physical environment is the same, but you can play checkers and chess. Two different games based on the same physical environment, if you wish. So sometimes we, as architects or designers, we focus too much on how the board looks. and We overlook the the rules governing that board. So yes, the board is important, but we we need to align even more in this post-pandemic world, the policies and rules of engagement with the board that we're playing with. And I think that's a really interesting point that you make there, because I think historically, as designers, we have been constrained to designing the board. We haven't had any real opportunity to engage with the policy, to engage with the culture and to challenge, you know, some of that thinking that then changes the way that the people, the occupants then engage with that board. And I think this is something that I'm seeing changing. There's more collaboration with psychology and organizational psychologists and change management, but there's also more engagement within the organization to be able to have different questions. I mean, one of the things that I reflect on is that I asked an organization what their values were and they looked at me and they said, what do you want to know what our values are for? You're the guy, you're the other person who puts the pretty colors in there and you design the workplace. Why do you want to know about this stuff? Now, thankfully, that isn't the conversation I'm having anymore, but it's taken us, you know, 
been doing this for 20 years now, like it's taken 20 years for us to change that conversation. I think this is exactly what you're touching on in the book. The biggest opportunity to your point is, I think, to design work first and then the workplace. Yes. Because by the time the assumption of work hit us, it has all these flaws that we are just in some instances, well, would you, do you like better green or red or yeah. blue? <laughs> but it, it, so, yeah, so now if we have the opportunity to design work first, that is where um, the, the biggest uh, transformation for the workplace moving forward would be. But then, of course, it's the um, it's not easy. As a designer, as you mentioned, when you try to ask the organization those questions, say, well, hold on. Uh, I thought you were going to ask about the number of people or, or how many desks. They're not prepared for that. Um, my PhD was based on the intersection of people, space, and technology and the lack of leadership in the intersection. So you have FM, IT, and HR, and they're very good at looking at the organization at those three lenses. But it's so hard to occupy the center. And when someone puts their, their head, hands up, the other two say, well, they hammer you down because you're not HR, you're not IT, or you're not FM. What are you doing here? So it's, it's a very hard space, but that's where we need to be. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I did a really great episode on that about redesigning work before the workplace with Dan Motto. He, was, um, he is a, an organizational leader in that space and they did a fantastic example of that with their their workplace at Redbubble. They started looking at well, what does work look like and then how do we wrap an environment around that and that is a conversation I'm having much more but as you said, you know, often as designers and strategists we're not engaged to come in and have those conversations. We're not empowered enough to have those conversations to change that. We need enlightened people within organisations to start that conversation and then bringing the right people to the table. So, yeah, I think this is a great book to start with. So I'll be recommending it to a, a lot of my clients. I think one of the things that I'd really like to understand from you is doing this process, you know, taking this pilgrimage, writing this book, developing these 34 signposts that you've collated here. What was the main idea that I think did it inspire you to rethink? Like what did you think that you knew was correct that then you started to realize was actually flawed and you really wanted to sort of relook at that and reevaluate your own thinking on that? Well, that's a great question. So I came back from the walk, 42 days, and I came back and I said, I didn't learn anything, you know, like people were asking me, people that are knew that I was doing this and they were willing to catch up with me. They were hoping to seem like the Messiah, you know, the enlightened one. Oh, enlightened one, tell uh, us yeah, more. <laughs> little ones, learn about the lessons of the workplace. And i disappointed because I, I couldn't articulate what I learned. It took me years to be able to digest what is it that I learned. Um, but very quickly, though, uh, when I came back to my day job, I realized that the things that we were measuring were important but not sufficient to take us to where I thought these signposts were taking us. Even though I didn't know where the signposts were, I thought, well, perhaps measuring how many people fit in a building is not the best metric. What if we start measuring dignity in the workplace, for example? What if we start measuring more human dimensions to it? So did an experimental uh, uh, measurement of dignity and how it travels in the organization. And so it was already that thing. It was a process, slow maybe, took years, but that it was not a light bulb moment. Yes, this is it. It was a progression of it. But I do believe that as, again, technology, AI, and all the challenges that we have ahead of us and opportunities, we need to put the human back into the work that we do. The future of work is human, and we need to design workplaces that way. And I think you just answered my final question, which was going to be, what opportunity do you think we have for the future of workplace design? And it's really about creating more human-centered workplace environments. Yeah, what I find interesting about the human center philosophy of design is that if we don't have that approach or that label in the service that we give to our clients, what type of design are we doing? Building design. Yeah, exactly right. And we're doing building design. We're designing for uh, building efficiencies, for all the things that satisfy the building, but not the human in it. 
So I understand the need of human-centered design, but also I think it's a lost battle of designers that they allow that to be a specialization rather than stay within the core of design. Because if you don't have in your business car or your services human-centered design, what type of design are you delivering? Yeah, very good point. And yeah, the fact that you said you pointed out that it has to be a specialization rather than the norm, that's a bit concerning really, isn't it? Because we design spaces for people. That's who occupies them. That's what it's all about. Look, Gus, this has been a fascinating conversation and I could sit here and talk to you for hours because there's so much more I want to dive into and like just extract as many of these great ideas from your brain as possible. But Look, I just want to say thank you so much for for joining me today and for sharing everything that you have. You have even been so generous to make your book available for free. Um, So thank you. So I will put a link in the show notes to your book, The Pilgrim's Guide to the Workplace. So you can also listen to it on Audible. You've got it on Audible now. So that's great. So you can listen in the car, you can download it, or you can actually order a printed copy as well if you're interested. But if anyone wants to get in touch with you, Gus, and wants to continue this conversation or, you know, wants to, to know more about you, how do they get in touch with you and what kind of opportunities would be the best ones for them to, to chat to you about? Well, first of all, thanks, Mel, for this opportunity. Uh, fantastic. I really enjoy the conversation. Your questions were quite fascinating, very difficult ones to answer, but uh, <laughs> hopefully they came through. And um, yeah, perhaps LinkedIn, you know, it's the best yep. uh, way, uh, the best platform to, to continue conversations. And I will welcome the opportunity to engage with our, your audience. Wonderful. Look, thank you again, Gus. I really enjoyed it. You answered my questions beautifully and I'm sorry that they were a bit difficult, but there's so many things in there that I want to get to. So um, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Gus. Thanks, Vale. 